how, how to hit them bass notes, okay? In the choir, he's always singing way up here. And <laughs> No, nah, no, nah, he doesn't. Psalm chapter 18, last Sunday we were speaking about praising the Lord. Well, we have a God that's worthy to be praised, don't we? Let me pause before I get into the sermon. Let me ask you, how many NC State fans do we have in here? Amen. God help y'all. You can get right with God at the end of this service, all right? How many of you watched that NC State Tar Heel game last night? Now, let me ask you. Yeah, I watched it, but I didn't watch a game. I watched a slaughter. It was awful, wasn't it? How many of you State fans were getting into that game cheering for it? Anybody cheering? Yeah, you were there, weren't you, Sean? Hey, were you sitting there? I bet you were standing up there watching that, those basketball players, watching your team win. I bet you sat there like this the whole time. Did you? Did you just sat there like that the whole time? Don't you lie to me. The second... Hey, look here. It am, never ceases to amaze me how we'll get excited over our sports teams, but we won't get excited about the things of God. And we will become dedicated to our sports teams and to these different heroes of ours, but we won't become dedicated to God. That makes no sense to me. Now, I am a Tar Heel fan. I, I, I wear a Tar Heel t-shirt and all that. But I want to tell you something. Tar Heels never died for me on the cross. And uh, if they could, I guarantee they wouldn't. I guarantee they wouldn't. Now, if you're a Tar Heel fan, you ought to get excited. Well, once they give us a good reason, you ought to get excited. Amen. But... How can we get excited about those things of the world and not be excited about the things of God? That blows my mind. To think that there's this holy, holy, holy God that loves me while I was yet in my sin, nothing worth loving. I was yet in my sin, and yet He loved me so much that He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on a cross for me. And on that cross... He became sin for me. He he bore my sins in His own body while He hung on that cross. He paid sin's penalty for me so that all I had to do is call on the Lord Jesus Christ, accepted Him as my Savior, and I could become a child of God. How, How in the world can that not excite somebody? Well, Pastor, I got excited about it when I first got saved, but that was 20 years ago. Well, let me ask you something. Are you still, are you still saved 20 years later? I mean, did, did he leave you? No answer there. <laughs> no, he, he hasn't left me. He said, I'll never leave thee. Nor He's never left me. Gypsy Smith, it was, was preaching, famous evangelist. He had been preaching for years, getting near the end of his life, and he still preached with that same fire, that same fervency. And somebody came to him and said, Mr. Smith, let me ask you, how is it that here you've been preaching all these years and you still preach as passionately as you did when you were a young man? I heard you preach as a young man. You preached with such passion and fire. And now you're near the end of your life. You're getting older. Your your, your uh, uh, strength is, is not as strong as you used to be. How in the world do you keep that passion? And Gypsy Smith looked at him and said, Sir, I've never lost the wonder of it all. He said, I've never gotten over the fact that this holy God could love a sinner like me. I've never gotten over the fact that Jesus would become sin for me so that I could become His righteousness, so that I could become a child of God. We watch those sports teams. We listen to uh, uh, we, uh, the, the kids sang, and boy, we clapped for them, didn't we? And there's nothing wrong with that. Hey, you did a good job. We ought to encourage them to, to serve God. There's nothing wrong with that. Boy, a young person that will serve God, I'll clap for them all day. I'll shout for them. I'll cheer them. I'll, I'll carry you on my shoulders. Uh, I'm glad to see a young person with some backbone and enough courage and enough fortitude to stand for God and do right in a society that pushes us to do wrong. Some of you that are in, in middle school and in senior high school, and you're, you're taking a stand, you're living for God. Hey, let me just say, I want to applaud you. Praise God. You've got some backbone. You, you, you've got some gumption about you. You ought to stand for the Lord and, and hold your head high. <clears throat> We will clap for our sports team. We'll clap for a singer. 
But when it comes to the things of God, we become very cold. We become very hard-hearted. We become calloused. And listen, in the Christian life, often we begin to lose the wonder of it all. Now let me tell you something. If you get to that point that you're losing the wonder of it, here's one of the reasons it is, is because you're not really, really walking with him. Because if you were getting in his presence daily, I'm talking in his presence, not just saying, Lord, thank you for this food, amen. I'm talking getting alone with God, in the presence of God, and seeking his face, and just spending time with him, personal, intimate time, speaking to God. And boy, the holiness of God and the righteousness of God and the love of God and the mercy and the grace of God, as you got closer to Him, you would see that more and more clearly and you wouldn't lose the wonder of it. The wonder would get greater. I trusted Christ as a young man, 13 years old, February 3rd, 1983. I happen to remember that because somebody... I want you to write that down. You don't have to remember that day and that time, that specific day uh, by the date. You, all you've got to do is trust Christ. But I remember I trusted Christ that day. And oh man, I, hey, saved. I was excited about that. Well, may I tell you here, I'm 43 years old now, 30 years later. And I'm here to tell you that I'm more excited about being a child of God now than I was then. I'm glad about five others are. I'm more excited now about being a child of God now than I, I than I was then. You see, I, I didn't understand it all then. All I understood was, hey, I'm saved. Hey, I, my sins are forgiven. I'm taking him at his word. My sins are forgiven. Oh, and boy, over the years, I've learned more and more what it meant to be saved and the glory of it and the wonder. Hey, I'm plumb excited about it. Well, I've tried that Christian life. It just didn't do anything for me. Oh, no, you didn't try the Christian life then. Hey, there's something about living for God. I'm, hey, I'm not talking about just going to church and sitting down when you're supposed to sit down, standing up when you're supposed to stand up, opening the hymn book, sitting down. I'm talking that personal walk with God. There's something exciting about it. There's something about this book right here. The Bible says it's quick and powerful. That word quick there doesn't mean fast. It means alive. This is a living book. There's something about this book right here that doesn't grow old. Hey, I have no idea how many times I've read this book all the way through. I haven't counted. I have no idea how many times. But I do know this. I can read through it and still see things that I did not see the first time that I read. It jumps off the page. Sometimes it's almost like God grabs me by the shoulders and says, Hey, look there, Ronnie. Well, from this book, I still get comfort. From this book, I still find a source of joy. From this book and in the presence of God, I still find the the direction and the guidance that I need. In Psalm chapter 18, verse 3, we spoke last week about praising God and how that it's comely to praise God. It's appropriate, the Bible says, to praise God. In Psalm chapter 18, verse 3, David said, I will call... Upon the Lord, <clears throat> who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from mine enemies. That is also quoted in Second Samuel chapter 22 as David sings. He says, and David spake unto the Lord the words of this song in the day that the Lord delivered to him out of the hands of all his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. And he said, now listen to this song he sings. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, the God of my rock. In Him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge, my Savior. Thou savest me from violence. I will call upon the name of the Lord, or will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. So the Bible tells us He's worthy of that praise. Now what does that praise mean? We talked about last week. It means to brag on. It means to lift Him up. It means to exalt Him. And the Bible says that we are a people, we ought to be a people that praises God, that lifts up Jesus Christ before this world. We talked about last week, you read the Word of God. The people of Israel, when they were right with God, they praised God. Listen, it was not just an inward thing. 
They were very demonstrative with their praise. We saw that in praising God, they would sing praises to God. We saw that they would shout praises to God. They would, uh, Psalm 47, went, Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Sometimes they praised Him in the dance. And I'm like Brother Rouse. I don't know what dance it was they were doing, but I want to find out so that I can do some of that. It won't be the twist. It won't be the jerk, the mashed potato, the cabbage patch. But they, they praised Him in the dance. They praised Him with their music. They praised Him in the congregation. They praised Him at all times, the good and the bad. They rejoiced in the Lord. They praised Him in all places. And that praise was demonstrative. They were telling people, hey, look, we have a great God. Man, we'll cheer about everything, won't we? Except Jesus. Somebody say, are, are, you, are you a Christian? Oh, well, uh, yeah, 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 sure, I'm a Christian. Hang our head? What in the world? How, how, how would you feel? How would you, let's see, George? How would you feel if somebody came up to you and you were standing kind of back and, and they said, hey, are you his wife? And she said, well, yeah, I guess I am. I, you know. It's already happened, hasn't it, George? <laughs> Wouldn't feel too good about that, would you? No, how would you feel, Tierra, if somebody said, hey, is that young lady over there your wife? And he said, well, I guess. I mean, yes, sometimes I guess, yeah, she acts like one. Uh, okay. Do what? You've got a belt? <laughs> oh, mercy, I'm starting a feud right here. No, I, you wouldn't feel good about that, would, would you? I love to hear my wife brag on me. That's kind of fleshly. Well, that's what I'm living in, folks. I can't help it. I do like to hear my wife brag on me. I'm not sure. She probably likes to hear me brag on her. Maybe not quite so much. Sometimes I tend to embarrass her. I brag on her so much. And I, I try not to talk about my wife so much. And I'm really trying to cut back on talking about my wife when I'm preaching. Because I'm scared to death I'm going to embarrass my wife talking so much about my wife in these services. That's my wife right there. I'm sure that when she hears me telling others, I'm sure she's, oh, that, that's good. Let me tell you something. I'm really not worthy of praise. I'm really not. But he is. And boy, if we wouldn't want anybody hanging their head. Boy, if, if, if I was a, 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 just a little bit away from my boys and I heard somebody say, hey, is that your dad? And then I heard my boys say, well, yeah. I try not to let people know it. I'll, I'll be honest, that'd crush me. That'd kill me. I'm not ashamed of my daddy. I don't want to be the kind of daddy that my boys are ashamed of. How do you think God feels when we neglect to praise Him? The Bible, once again, folks, it said that He's worthy of praise. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 8, we learn one of the names of God. that The Hebrews had many names for God. One of the names is Jehovah Jireh. We learn that in Psalm 22, 8. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Jehovah Jireh, God will provide. Abraham and Isaac, uh, God said, Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, Isaac, go up there to Mount Moriah. I want you to build an altar, and on that altar, you're going to lay your son, you're going to give your son to me as a sacrifice. Abraham and his son and some of his servants began to head towards Mount Moriah, several days' journey. They get to the base of the mountain, and Abraham tells his, his servants, listen, y'all wait here. Me and my son are going to go up and offer a sacrifice to the Lord. We'll be back. As they're going up the mountain, Isaac asked a question that I'm sure Abraham was hoping wouldn't be asked. He said, Daddy, I see the wood for the offering, the burnt offering. I, I see we have the fire. see we have the knife, but Daddy, where's the lamb? Abraham said, Son, God will provide a lamb. <clears throat> 
Abraham takes his son up there, Isaac, and he, he lays him on that altar. Now listen, we can read over in Hebrews that Abraham was fully persuaded that he was going to have to take his son life, but that God was going to restore him to life. Abraham was fully persuaded. He said, God promised that through this son right here that my seed will be blessed and my seed will be as the sand of the sea and the stars of the sky. That's what God says. So if God wants me to take his life, God's going to bring life back into me. That's the word of God. He promised me. Oh, can you imagine that daddy even knowing that God had plans for this boy? Can you imagine the anguish as he thought, man, I, I just really, I don't want to do this. And he tells him, son, I, I'm sorry to tell you this, but God wants you to be the sacrifice. He's asked me to sacrifice you. But listen, I, I don't want to do it, but son, don't be scared. God said he has a plan for your life further on, so he must be going to bring you back to life. Son, just trust me. Let's just trust God. And he raises that knife in his hand as he gets ready to plunge it down into his son's chest. He hears an angel say hold on Abraham don't touch him God was just testing you to see if you really loved him don't touch the boy and Abraham looks over and there's a ram caught in the thicket and Abraham says hey son look Isaac here let me untie you here get off that altar look God did it he provided what we needed for a sacrifice he's our provider see we were lost in sin Nothing we on our own could do to merit salvation. No way we could be righteous enough to get to heaven. And so God says, listen, they need a payment to be made for them, an everlasting payment, and here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to provide my son as the propitiation, the substitute, the payment for their sin And Jesus hung on that cross for us and He bore our sin in His own body. He became sin for us. He paid sin's penalty for me. God provided access to heaven through Jesus Christ. Hey, if that's all He did, that's worth praising Him for, folks. Hey, that's worth every once in a while clapping for God. That's worth every once in a while saying, Hallelujah, God, You're a great God. That's worth singing about Him. That's, I saw Bill Burr one time. I saw him praise God in the dance up at pastor school. Old Bill Burr, he's a big man. He's probably 350, 400 pounds. West Virginia boy. And man, he could sing. And man, we was up there at pastor school and, and this choir got to singing about the Lord and it got good. And old Bill Burr, he's probably in his 60s, getting close to 70. He stood up real slow and oh, he was so excited in the Lord. He clapped his hands and he was smiling. And next thing you know, he started. That's all he could do, that old man. But he was so excited, the best he could, he was praising God in the dance. Brother Gal here, I'm waiting to see you do that. He's our provider. How can we not praise Him? How can we not lift Him up? At work, listen, I've told you, before I was here, I resigned my position as youth pastor uh, at the church I was at. I got a job working at Walmart, and I was determined, man, this is my mission here. While I'm here, I want to tell some people about Christ. Oh, pastor, you can't do that on the job. You can if you know how. All you got to do is answer the questions they ask. And all I needed them to ask was this. I, I'd ask them first, say, hey, how are you doing today? Well, you know what they're going to say? Fine, how are you? That's just courteous, right? And when they'd say, fine, how are you? I'd say, well, let me tell you, God's been good to me. And just begin to tell them, hey, boy, the Lord's been good to me. And sneak it in on them, telling them about Jesus Christ. Before long, they'd come to me at work. They'd walk by and they'd say, hey, 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 preacher man, will you pray for me? Will you pray for him to preach a man? Will you, hey, sometimes they'd, they'd use some foul language. They'd take God's name as a cuss word. And I'd say, hey, hey, God didn't do anything to you to deserve to be cussed. And they'd say, oh, sorry, preacher man. I'm sorry, preacher man. Will you pray for me? I'm trying to stop cussing. Said, I'll pray for you. Hey, come preacher man, pray for me. Boy, I'm having trouble with my wife. I'm having trouble with my child. Now, why would they come ask me to pray for them? What, because I'm a great man, but they knew I must be serving a great God because I kept telling them about my God. Okay? Hey, he's a provider. In Exodus chapter 15, verse 26, it says, and, and, and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and wilt do that which is right in his sight, 
and will give ear to his commandments and keep all his statutes. I will put none of these diseases upon thee, which I have brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. He's our healer. Jehovah Rapha is what it is in, in, the, uh, in the Hebrew. The Lord our healer. He, healed, he took our infirmities upon himself. And listen, now I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. And now when God looks at me, Brother Thomas, he doesn't look at Ronnie Wise, a lost sinner. He looks at Ronnie Wise that have been, has been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ and clothed in the righteousness of Christ. I'm not worthy of that. But he's my healer. He's my provider. Hey, in, uh, in Exodus chapter 17, verse 15, the Bible says this, And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nisi. The word, uh, uh, it, it means the Lord, our banner. You know what a banner is? It's a rallying point. In the military, they have what they call guidons. I heard a story once back in the, I think it was the Civil War. An old boy was the, the standard bearer. He, he, he carried the guide on. It was the rallying point. The troops, would, they didn't know where to go. They were getting lost on the battlefield. They could look for their, their platoon's guide on, that standard. And they say, hey, that's where I'm supposed to be over there. And boy, that, that general told the troops, said, charge. And they began to charge and they fell under heavy fire. And they, they shrunk back. They began to treat all except that young boy carrying the guide on, the standard, that banner. He kept on running. Man, he is almost on the enemy. He crouched down behind a rock or some obstacle there. And he was taking shelter from the fire. And his sergeant yelled back, Hey, young man, standard bear, bring the standard back to the men. He said, No, sir, you bring the men up to the standard. Hey, you know Jesus Christ in this tough, isn't it a tough world? Hey, it's tough, folks. Whether you're saved or not, those people that preach that if you're saved, everything goes well, there's nothing goes wrong. They haven't been reading the book right here. Hey, Job, you look at Job. Look at Daniel, tossed in the lines. They look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, cast in the fiery furnace. Now, God delivered them, but God will deliver us too. Amen. <clears throat> hey, look, he's our rallying point. Man, when I, when I can't find my way in this world, I can always run to him. When I'm confused, hey, he's always right there for me. And I can rally around Christ. That word banner has to do with the rallying place. This altar that Moses built it was set up after the Lord allowed the children of Israel to, uh, to defeat the Amalekites. And he built it and he said, this is to remember that when we're in a battle, we can rally around our God. Hey, he's our rallying point. He's... He's our banner. In Leviticus chapter 20, verse 8, says, And ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23, And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and, and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Lord who sanctifies us, makes us holy. You know what that means? Hey, listen, here's what that means. He sets us apart for himself. When I trusted Christ as my Savior, and if you trusted Christ as your Savior, he sanctifies you. He says, okay, look, you're no longer part of the world. You are mine. The Bible says he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. That's not because of how good I am. It's because of how good God is. He sanctifies me. And boy, I try to give myself to him and say, Lord, I want to live a holy life. But listen, I cannot do that on my own. I can only do that through the power of the Holy Spirit of God. In Judges chapter 6, verse 24, the Bible says this, Then guilty Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord and called it Jehovah Shalom. Unto this day it is yet an offer of the Abba Israelites. Jehovah Shalom, it means this, The Lord is our peace. 
Boy, now, isn't that good? The Lord is our peace. Let me give you a little picture of that. The, the disciples and Jesus were out in the boat on the Sea of Galilee. Boy, that, the wind starts to whip and the waves start to churn in that boat. It's being tossed up and down in that, in that Sea of Galilee. Water's coming in over the side. The disciples get a little nervous. Like, hey, well, we're going to drown. And the master, he's down in the belly of the boat. He's asleep. And they run down in the belly of the boat and they wake him up. Master, do you not care that we perish? He said, oh, ye of little faith. He walks out there, stands on the edge of that boat. He looks out and he said, peace, be still. And the wind ceased to blow and the waves laid down at the foot of the boat. And there was peace. One of the things everybody in this world looks for, boy, I just want some peace. I just want some peace in this world. Boy, pastor, I'm going through a storm if I could just have some peace. Pastor, I'm going through a deep valley. I'm, I'm going through some deep waters right now. And boy, my life is in turmoil. And it seems like one wave after another is hitting me. He's our peace. I saw a, a painting one time. or I, 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 I saw a picture of the painting. I didn't see the painting in person. It was a picture of a painting. The name of the painting was Peace. And you look at that painting and it was a it showed a, a, a rock face, a cliff on the edge of the ocean, and, and man, there was a, a, a harsh storm in the ocean. The waves were high and over there was a boat out there and there was a lighthouse and, and the waves are going over the boat and man, it's just an awful scene. There's lightning coursing through the sky, and you can tell the wind's blowing, it's raining almost sideways. And if you look at that rock face, back at there's a there was a little cleft in the rock. A little inset in the rock, and in that inset, there was a little dove. While the storm raged all around, and the rain was beating down, and the wind was blowing, and the thunder was rolling, and the lightning was cracking, in the midst of the storm, that little dove sat in the cliff's face in peace. That's exactly, listen now, that's exactly what God does for us, isn't it? He gives peace. In the midst of the storm. Hey folks, I'm trying to tell you tonight. He's worthy to be praised. Romans 5, 1, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. In uh, Philippians 4, 7, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Jesus said in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let it be afraid. He said, I'm leaving peace with you. He's our peace. Here's the last thing in Second Corinthians, or in Jeremiah 33, 16. In those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith she shall be called, the Lord, our righteousness. He is our righteousness. You see, look, the Bible says that all my righteousnesses in the eyes of God are as filthy rags compared to His righteousness. All the good that I can humanly do compared to, to the holiness of God, my good is as filthy rags. And here I was lost. Oh God, I, I don't want to go to hell. What are we going to do? Once again, as I said earlier, he sent Jesus Christ. And when Jesus became sin for us, boy, what a great exchange right here. He became sin for us so that we could become righteousness in him. How did that happen? Through Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ. I, I've got three people awake in here. I'm so glad you are with me then how can we as Christians walk around always down in the mouth? Pastor, you don't understand how bad things are in my life. No, maybe I don't. Maybe I haven't traveled in your shoes. I'm not minimizing anything you're going through. But I do know this, no matter how great your trial, how great your trouble, we have an even greater God. I believe that. I believe that with all my heart. And that God, God he, he's, he's brought me through some deep waters. He's brought, brought me through some pretty harsh storms, some pretty scary times. Pastor, how do, you, how do you always seem on fire? 
I'll be honest, I'm not always on fire. Not always on top. I'm human, okay? But it don't take me long. All I got to do is think about how good God is. No matter how bad everything else is, folks, we have a good God. Listen now, as David said once again, I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised. Hey, church, yeah, I believe all things should be done decently and in order, but as I said last week, we have a very firm handle on that. We don't have to worry about that right there. We need to be a church that welcomes praise. It's okay. You know what? It's okay when uh, Brother Perry says, Everybody stand, get a hymn book, let's all sing together. It's okay to smile. We're singing, Victory in Jesus, my Savior. For, for real? We're singing, Happy am I. How can I help but shout it? You're not convincing anybody. You can smile. I don't feel like smiling. Fake it. He's worthy. Uh, hey, you can even do this. When Brother Perry gets up to lead the singing, you can actually sing. There's nothing wrong. Pastor, I can't carry a tune in the bucket. The Bible just says make a joyful noise. That's all you got to do. Make a noise. Joyful for the Lord. It's Hey, sometimes, hey, I don't mind you clapping for our singers. I mean encouraging them to serve God. I don't mind that. But it's okay to clap for the Lord too. Hey, boy, the Lord's been good to me. It's okay to brag on him in here. It's all, By the way, it's okay to brag on him at home. It's okay to brag on him at your neighborhood. It's okay to brag on him where you work. We should be lifting him up. He said, if, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. Church, let's be a church that praises a God that's worthy to be praised. Bow your head and close your eyes, please.